everybody, it's Craig Syracuse. Welcome to a new episode of Walk in Faith. Yes, we are in the Opera House, the Emmaus Center. I'm excited to be sitting down with Barbara from Harlem. Barbara, thank you so much for sitting down with me. Thank you I for having me. It. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, I was reading your book and we spoke on the green room and I had to stop, right? And I had to like reflect and I told my wife, like I think it was the first few pages about, you know, the adversity that you went through. And I knew the ending, obviously, because you're here, how you overcame that adversity. But in case the audience is not familiar with your story, if you could fill us in, tell us about what it was like to grow up in Harlem, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, Harlem was very different in my day. It wasn't um, a perfect environment, but it was livable. We knew everyone, everyone knew us, and um, you know, we did have some drug addicts that would you know, interfere when we were jumping rope or something like that. But we learned how to live with that. We learned how to live with a lot of things, you know, a lot of fighting, a lot of profanity, et cetera, et cetera. I grew up in the street because my mother, after my father and my mother, they were not together, mm -hmm. she had to work and she worked nights. So that meant me and my brothers and, you know, we hung out on the stoop. Um, but thank God it wasn't um, at the point that it is now. In other words, we didn't have a lot of black on black crime you know, we just stayed together as a family, did our little dirt together, you know, ran into the store, grabbed a package <laughs> of Franks, ran out and sat on the stoop and ate them, <laughs> you know, and that was my life, particularly when uh, my mother and my father weren't together. When they were together, we were a middle class family and life was different because, you know, daddy was coming home. He was a mechanic, he did auto body work, and um, he must have been good at it because he did that all of his life that I knew him. He just died in 2015, mm. uh, 2015 I mean, and um, he was 97 years old. Wow. He worked six days a week at least, but he never worked for anyone. And um, yes, yeah, so we would go up there to the garage and play in the garage, play around the dirt, hold a flash flashlight for him. Wow. But it was um, exciting and it was sad not having a father in the house, mm. but we survived. And that was something, and I said to you off camera, you know, yes. there's certain topics that for some reason, I know it's God, you know, these, these certain yeah. topics that keep coming across my plate recently, the Kendrick brothers, I'm excited. I was invited to the Fatherhood Commission yeah. in, in uh, December because of a good friend. And it's something that I experienced just recently during COVID, it was sort of this awakening which we both talk about okay. this awakening that God said to me and I felt in my heart that I was chasing something and I was neglecting my family life I wasn't home I wasn't with my son I wasn't spending that quality time right but I'm grateful that I experienced that at still such a young age and we see now in society mm -hmm. the destruction of the nuclear family why it's yeah. promoted we want to get into but the devastation of not having a father figure in the house, the statistics. So if you could tell us a little bit about how your life changed when your father and mother split up, but also some of the statistics that um, have led to from fatherless homes. I'm thankful to God that I did know my father. And I have a father's name on my birth certificate. Children being born now, we have in the black community, 73% of our children are born without a father in the home. That is devastating. That happened in the 60s and 70s. When I was growing up, there were five of us girls about the same age. Only one had children outside of wedlock. Mm. The rest of us were married before we had children. But now it's overwhelming. I, I ran a family daycare center for many years in the Bronx, and I had to look at birth certificates to allow the, uh, the, the mothers to enroll their children. When I saw birth certificates where it says father, it was blank. I closed my office door and put my head on the desk and cried. I cried for those children who don't even have a father's name on their birth certificate. It's devastating. We don't have to wonder why 70% of those children, of those young men in particular, in prison come from single, headed households. They don't have a daddy. That's no wonder. We have gangs running the streets. We have drug lords pimping out our children. 
because we don't have fathers. We don't have that protector there. We don't have that provider there. And many of the mothers, some of them are struggling to make it. Some of them have given up on making it. And these children are at high risk. I ran an organization for over 20 years that my sons and I started called Looking Toward Tomorrow. And what's in those homes many times would break your heart. Even though they get governmental assistance, many times the children are not the priority because the mothers themselves are devastated and they've been rejected so often. So it's um, a dangerous lifestyle now. It's a dangerous life in Harlem, as a matter of fact. Much more violence, much more callousness, much more um, just inhumane mm -hmm. treatment of each other. And that is devastating, and that is very sad. Does it affect women the same way? I know a lot of statistics are based on men, but for instance, in a household, um, you know, a young lady, what happens to her usually? Does she still, does she follow that same trajectory of uh, whether it's not finishing college, joining a gang, yeah. selling drugs? In many cases, yes. And then she may turn to sex, you know. In other words, maybe the next man will not leave me like the other one did. And that's why you have a lot of our young women who have babies by multiple partners because they think maybe the next one will stay. They want to be loved. A lot of them come from single-headed households, so they don't even know what it is for a man who's not wanting sex from them to mm -hmm. compliment them, validate them, affirm them. So they grow up just on the edge. And the first one that comes along and says a sing, sings a good song, boom. Mm. And then of many of them, because they, they've been, become pregnant at such a young age, are in their 20s and 30s trying to recapture their youth. You, you, you'll see many of them, they adopt a, um, the subculture code of dress. You know, the long eyelashes, the hair. And meanwhile, they're not even able or willing in some cases to help their children learn how to read, take them to the library, because they're trying to capture something that they feel that they never had. Mm. And it's a sad, sad, sad scenario. We used to have uh, workshops for our young mothers. And I have one workshop where I said, I want you to set a goal for your life. One young lady said she was gonna go to the dentist. This is how neglected, this is how confused many of them are. And they don't have anyone helping to hold their hands and guide them. They don't have these simple life skills. So we did what we could uh, for about 20, <laughs> 20 years when I had my sons oh, wow. with me. That is powerful. And we, we spoke too about this community in Williamsburg. The thing that I meet a lot is the, the nuns, let's call them, but they all say, I was raised dot, dot, dot. So I started yeah. calling them dot, dot, dot. And I've been trying to figure out what is the, the missing link. And I think a lot of it is back to the point is that they don't have the mirror of Christ. Absolutely. The fatherless you know, household. Yes. And I think that's something that's missing. And yeah. even to, like you said earlier about, about young ladies, like their first interpretation of a man is the way the father treats yeah. them or the way the father treats the yes. mother. Yes. And then from there is based on what they expect yes. a man or a man how to treat them. You mentioned about what's changed and you referenced something I love, Pope John Paul, and the quote that you use as the family goes, so does the nation and the whole world in which we live. That's a powerful uh, quote. Amen. Any reason why you, you, tell me what that means to you, like why did you pick the Pope John Paul quote? Families to me equal stability, identity, validation, security. Families were not important, God would not have created them. And you see, many times when we don't have immediate families, God gives us the family of believers to surround us. He gives us children in, God, in, in Christ. He gives us a mother, he gives us a father. Family is important for stability because you know we all want to be loved. And there's nothing more loving than a mother who loves you, a grandmother who loves you, but you have to know these people, mm -hmm. a father who loves you. We're made with that emptiness that we want to be loved. 
Now, God has created us with this void inside of us that he can only fill. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we know that. But he's also given us humans to shake our hands, hold us up when we can't, when we can't walk. Come give us a glass of water. You know, I meet young ladies on the street, and I, one, um, she was talking very horribly to her little child. I said, sweetheart, don't do that. This baby may have to bring you a glass of water one day. I don't want her to tarnish her relationship with that child. That's our family, and that's so important. That's why God created it. For us humans, we need it. Hmm. What did you do to overcome the adversity and the trials and tribulations? Did you lean on your faith? Yes. Because you had a lot. I mean, you had, you've been shot, right? Yes. Twice or three times? Well, and once. <laughs> once. I've been around shooting a lot. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, you went through a lot. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, you're sitting here and, you know, yes. years back, but you faced a lot of adversity and you continuously do. I yes. mean, so what do you lean on? I have to lean on, on God. You know, I, I had a, per, a time in my life People wonder how I can relate to people who are so depressed in darkness because I've been there. Even though I was raised in the church, basically, you stray. And some of the things in life, I, 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 I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, it's not included in the book, but I saw murder up close. When my husband and I separated and I had a boyfriend, uh, my husband blew his brains out. Wow in front of my children and in front of me. So I went through a period of deep depression and I, it was dark for me. And my mother came up from Florida and she said, the only one can help you now is God. And she left me, I used to sit in the corner wrapped up in a coat. Those words rang in my brain, those words are the only thing that delivered me out of darkness. Thorazine didn't do it. No psychiatrist could do it. It was God. And then I reflected on what I had learned as a child. God loves you. God sees you. God knows you. So even in spite of seeing brain matter on the floor, and, and, and my husband was a police officer <laughs> and killed my boyfriend. <laughs> and it almost killed me mentally. But only God can help you now, baby. And she took all five of my children to Florida and left me because it was me and God. Mm. And he delivered me. You see me today. See, I can go into a mental ward and talk to people who have had a breakdown. Because I've been there, done that, and God delivered me. Wow, that is powerful. Yes. And that is the thing that, you know, Yes. we have that foundation of faith, and I think that's something, too, that we don't see in today's generation. We don't. We don't see, they, they don't know what to lean on, no. so they lean on what society says. They lean on drugs, alcohol, feeding yeah. the flesh. They don't go yes. back to the fundamentals of the foundation of faith. And that's the only way you'll make it through. See, the streets will outlast all of us. The street, street life. Only God promises when I close these eyes, I will be with him. I have a better place to go to. How do we yeah. instill that? How do we, how do we break the cycle? Well, how we break the cycle is we keep on preaching it and we live it. I don't usually share a lot of my stuff, but um, I appreciate 2017, that. they discovered I had two giant aneurysms of the brain. One in the middle of my brain, one pushing my eye out. And I said, Lord, what do I do? If I don't have surgery and I have a stroke, I'll be on somebody's hand if I don't die. So I had surgery in 2017, two giant aneurysms. I said then, God, you must have me here for a reason. They didn't burst, and you see me. You don't even know it. 
No. And then the doctor was so good. I went to one doctor, he was gonna give me two operations. Went to another doctor at Columbia Presbyterian. He did both of them, mm. one operation, and didn't even cut my head. I said, well, I gotta work for you, Lord. The nurses would ask me, how can you be so calm? I said, everything is in God's hands. I don't worry. I just want to make sure I'm ready. That's all. Wow. Yeah. But that's not in my book either. No, no, I, I know. It's just, you know, just yeah. listening to you, I'm like, because there's so much that you're saying yeah. to unpack and just, you know, having that responsibility is, it's scary at times to know that you're, you're called for something greater, right? Amen. And what happens too is Amen. when you have that testimony. For me too, like I am, I'm freezing in here because someone has the air conditioner on, but like the, my faith, my testimony, yeah. my story, the fire that's inside of me is something that burns. And, and I don't expect people to understand it. True. I, True. And I, I'm okay with it. I don't try yeah. to explain it to them because it's something that yeah. I live and it's a lifestyle. It's something yeah. every day I wake up, I say, how am I going to bring people to Christ? Amen. How am I going to evangelize? How am I going to tell my Amen. story? And the fact that God trusts me and uses me oh, yeah. is something that I, I don't take for granted or take lightly. And I know every day, the same way I speak to my son and my life and what I do, it's, it's, it's a lot. Amen. You know, temptation Amen. comes and you have to sit there and yes. say, I'm called for something greater. Amen. And people are watching, whether it's people or he's watching. It's something I thought about too. It's like, you know, when, when people in this certain stages of their life, they, they you know, they'll, they'll tell their story or example and say, God, why is this happening mm -hmm. to me now? Why can't I find a job? Why am I divorced? Why am I hooked on drugs? Whatever. But they don't tell the beginning part of the story where they dropped out of school. Absolutely. They neglected to where pay child support or they didn't have a, a, a good foundation of faith. They leave that part out, but they're so quick to question or judge God yeah. and their story and their testimony instead of taking responsibility for their actions. That's so key. And you have that in your book. And I wanted you to, I mean, how important is it for us to take responsibility, to be honest, before we start questioning or, or you know, deeming God when it's really our own fault? Well, no healing emotionally, physically, or whatever can take place unless we acknowledge. We have to learn how to be truthful. We can't blame God for the bad choices we've made. We have to take responsibility. And people don't want to do that. We have to learn how to take responsibility. Show me, Lord. Show me where I need to correct myself. Show me. See, God's not going to come down to our level. I've been there where I, I wondered why did this happen to me? Mm -hmm. I've been there. I've been in the bar and saying, let me have, a, uh, let me have some Sheva's Regal and go in the restroom and say, God, where are you? I've been there. And it gets you no place mm -hmm. until you're honest, until you say, I have a problem. I need healing. When you do that, God does miraculous work in your life that door will open for that job, or he'll give you an idea about a business, and you will be successful. But you have to put him first. Mm -hmm. You can't put self first. Put him first. Then it's gonna be all right. Then it may take time, but slowly and methodically, it will all come together. And you'll say, I didn't even imagine it could be this good. That's our answer. Put him first. In everything you do. And everything. surrender it over to the Lord. Everything. So hard to say that, right? So hard for people to say, I surrender, to fully trust. Absolutely. You know, one of my favorite verses is 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, even when you open your mouth. And I have to catch myself sometimes because I'm brash. I'm from New York. <laughs> I have to really, really check me. <laughs> but... I have to do everything to the glory of God. And I use that even when I meet people who are so brainwashed and so burdened. I said, do everything to the mm. glory of God. Does that glorify God, the drugs? And they can't answer me yes. But it gives them something to think about. Mm. 
plant the seed. Yes. So Barbara, I mean, we could talk all day. Tell yes. me where can people, you know, whether it's your book or find out more about you, listen to your radio show. I mean, you have so much, another book coming out. Yeah. I mean, you're all over the place. So how could they get in contact with you? Well, we have a website, um, www.barbaraformholland.com. Our urban story, we broadcast that every Saturday at three o'clock. And as far as I know, it's still on ddvradio.com. Plus, we do it live on Facebook. Um, and then we also have on Wednesday, um, Pray and Fight for America. I usually post on social media that we pray together at 7.30 on Wednesday nights. Well, okay. Barbara, it's been a pleasure. I really oh. I look forward to seeing you again. We both live in New Jersey now. No more uh, yeah. Brooklyn or Harlem. And so, yeah. Barbara, thank you. God bless you. And thank you. And I don't know why you brought out so many things that I've never shared with anyone, but feels good. <laughs> Listen, Thank I, like you. I said, it's, I, I, I'm grateful that God uses me, Amen. Or, uh, you know, uses me to be a vessel, to be yes. able to, to tell the story, because it's not about me. It's Amen. about that one person, the dot, dot, dot. Yeah, yeah. And Barbara, thank you. And you're doing a wonderful job. Thank God you. bless you God and bless you. continue. Thank you very much. Amen. I appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Walk in Faith. Always remember you have the ability to inspire and evangelize through the words and actions. God bless you. Amen.